Thanks very much, everybody, for um, coming out tonight. Wonderful, uh, wonderful turnout. I'm still squeezing out the door there. I've got the, the first slot, um, and I'm going to talk you through uh, some stuff about the economics of independence, uh, and then I'll pass on to, to Philip and Jim. Just the first point, a lot of this stuff, or all of it's on YouTube, so if anybody's looking for anything afterwards, uh, to collect any, remember any points, or pass it on to anybody, um, if you search my name on YouTube, uh, this stuff will come up, and please feel free to pass it around. Um, very quickly, uh, my journey to yes, why I'm, um, why I'm here, as Ben's uh, identified, I've worked in manufacturing for, for 30 years. I've got businesses north and south of the border uh, and in Europe. And when the referendum came up as a live issue um, a couple of years ago, I thought it made sense to have a look at it, see how it would affect me and my businesses. And I did what I would do if it was a business investment. I went and looked at the numbers, dug up all the, the spreadsheets, downloaded all the information. There's plenty of information there um, if people want to go and look for it. Uh, ignored the political spin, analysed the data, and uh, what I found uh, surprised me. Because like you, I've probably been led to believe over the years that Scotland was uh, too weak, couldn't afford it, too poor, subsidised by down south, couldn't stand on its own two feet. When I actually went and ran the numbers and looked at it, what I found was, um, as I say, quite, uh, quite the opposite. And that's when I started to get involved, uh, involved in the campaign. I went along to one of the early... Business for Scotland meetings um, in the audience, volunteered for something, put my toe in the water, and before I knew it, I was in swimming with the sharks, and it's been uh, it's been entertaining. So I'll, um, I'll talk you through the data. There's a few numbers in it that has to be, I've tried to put to a minimum, um, but hopefully you'll find it interesting. The first point to note is that this, this is a rich country. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. The first thing I found out was that Scotland generates more tax per person than the UK average, which was a surprise for me and probably for, for a lot of people. Um, that's the data, that's just the last five years' data. The amount of tax generated per person in Scotland each year compared to the UK average. Um, we're talking about all taxes here, income tax, national insurance, VAT, corporation tax, road tax, a whole lot. And the amount of money that goes into the government um, per person divided by the population. Um, and over that five years, Scotland generating about £10,000 per person, which is about £1,200 more than the UK average. We do spend more than the UK average, but the tax we generate more than, more than covers that. Um, so in relative terms, we are a net contributor to, uh, to Westminster. And that's not just true in the last year or the last five years. We've got data going back 30 years, and that's the data back to 1980. When they started, when the UK government started collecting this uh, this information, and there's two lines on there: uh, the dark line, the higher line, is Scotland's tax generated per person. The other line, the lower line, is the UK number. Um, and every year, Scotland's number is more. Some years it's a bit more. Other years it's an embarrassing amount more. But that's the trend. That's the history. And that's the the reality of the economic uh, economic situation. As I said, we generate um, more tax, we spend a bit more, but the tax we generate more than covers that. If we'd had the same percentage of spend back from the UK government, because the way it works at the moment is all the tax pretty much goes there, and then they give us some of it back through what they call the Barnet formula. If we'd had the same amount of spend back to Scotland um, as the percentage of tax we generated over the last five years, we'd have had an extra eight and a half billion to, uh, to spend in Scotland. So it's a uh, that's about £1,600 per person. So that's the reality of what has happened in the past, not the political spin on what might happen in the future. Gross domestic product is how they measure internationally the wealth of countries. When they talk about which countries are the richest, that's how they measure it. Um, when they talk about how much the economy is grown by, 1%, 2%, 3% a year, they're measuring the growth of what they call gross domestic product, which is basically a measure of how much economic activity, how much wealth, is generated in the country. Scotland's GDP per head is higher than the UK. Again, the same story going back through through the decades. 11% um, higher last year, 18% higher the year before, on average about 15% higher. Interestingly, when you exclude oil from the picture and only look at onshore economic activity, Scotland's GDP per person is about the same as the UK average. Oil is very much the icing on the cake. It's the extra revenue that gives us the opportunity to invest in Scotland for the future. And the question is, who do you trust to manage the second half of the oil bonanza? Because we are about halfway through. 
in terms of revenue, do you trust uh, Westminster to squander the second half like they did the first half, or the people of Scotland to invest it in Scotland for the future? In terms of GDP, which is how they measure these things, an independent Scotland would be the 14th richest country in the world, with the UK at number 18 based on last year's data. And interestingly, that's the chart of the richest, richest countries in the world. And there's something you notice about that chart if you have a look through it. Okay, a lot of those countries are very similar sized countries to Scotland. Um, around about 5 million people, North and West European independent countries. Another thing, of course, is most of them. Oh, I'm sorry, right. We should close the door, I think. Or is that. Is that. Can we turn up the mic? Who's got the. Who's got the volume control for the mic? Can we turn that up a bit? Hello? Is that, uh, is that better? Yeah. Good idea. What's your last word? Can we can we squeeze any more people in around here? Some people can come and stand here, and there's people in there's space here. Yeah, space, uh, yeah, space here. Either side of the front. Here. The doors are open, I'm not sure where we could do so. Yeah, we can have a bit more. We move over, are we in your way? No, it's concerning. It's all okay, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I still need to send it. You can still see it. Okay. Should I recap on some of this stuff? I'll just push it on. <laughs> right. Um, richest countries in the world. So there you go. The interesting thing is how many of those countries are countries like Scotland? Um, five million or so people, give or take, uh, independent North and West European countries. Most of whom, with the exception of Norway, obviously have uh, a lot less natural resources than we do. Um, so, the, the few that don't, US, Canada, Australia, the thing that they've got in common, of course, is they used to be uh, used to be removed from London, and despite what Obama says, you don't see them queuing up to come back under Westminster control anytime, anytime soon. Um, that's from Standard & Poor's report um, from early this year, talking about the strength of the Scottish economy. Um, rich, relatively diversified. They're not worried about oil, which is only 15% of our economy. They don't think that's too much. Um, and even excluding oil, they're talking about Scotland would qualify for their highest economic assessment. So they don't see any, any concerns about the strength or wealth of the, uh, the Scottish economy. So you're probably all standing there, or sitting there thinking, um, if the numbers say that Scotland's a rich country, why does it not look like it when you drive around certain parts of it? And I had the same question. I said, how can this, how can this be true? Because my eyes are telling me something different to what the numbers say. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple, of, a couple of maps now, which maybe help to explain that. Uh, hopefully you can see that at the back. The first one is a gross domestic product of the amount of economic wealth that's generated in different parts of the UK, basically the darker the colour. Uh, the more wealth is generated in that part of the country. Now, as you'd expect, the city of London, along the M4 corridor, um, a bit around the kind of Manchester area, and then the north, uh, east, northeast of Scotland and across the central belt to some extent, that's where the wealth is, uh, is generated in Scotland. And if you look at that just by Scotland and the rest of the UK, you see Scotland, as I said, has got a, a GDP, a national wealth, generated higher, about 15% higher than the UK average. The next chart, is from the UK Office of National Statistics. This is a, a measure of where the wealthiest households are in the UK. Now they measure wealth, uh, they've got a number which is 967,000 pounds of total household assets. That includes your house, your pension, your savings, your, your car, your yacht, whatever, whatever all added up. And um, 
the data says south coast of England, more than 13% of households are in the, the wealthy household category. It becomes less and less. Further north you go, and in Scotland, it's less than that, less than seven percent. So if you flick back between those two, it kind of answers the paradox of why, if I pay for Scotland generating the wealth, why does it not look like it? Basically, because over the decades it's been the flowing south, and as we saw, only a percentage of it coming back, uh, coming back north again. Um, so in answer to the question, too poor, I right, don't believe it. Don't let them tell you that we can't. Okay, there's a reason why they tell you that, because um, politicians on the no side obviously have got a vested interest, and uh, people ask me about employment prospects in an independent Scotland, and I'm going to talk briefly about that in a minute, but they ask me how many jobs would go if Scotland became independent, and so that answer is easy, it's, uh, it's 59, and it's a number of the West so... Uh, Bear that in mind when I'm telling you you're too mean, you're too poor. Um, opportunities. Um, I've been asked to talk a wee bit about uh, opportunities, what happens, uh, what we can do. If independent, and it's, it's something that's close to my heart, uh, manufacturing, I've worked in it uh, all my life and seen, uh, seen the mess that's been made of the UK economy from a manufacturing point of view by successive governments. Um, and we'll talk about, about that in a minute. But it's all about reindustrializing the country, making the investment back into the country, having a focus on high value manufacturing jobs rather than the, the UK government's focus on the city of London. Infrastructure investment, which the Scottish government thankfully has done uh, more of than, uh, than we've, we've, we've had previously. But if you compare that to the amount of money that the UK contributes to the city of London, uh, uh, infrastructure investment, we're way, way, way behind. There's huge potential there to do an awful lot more to open up parts of Scotland and speed up uh, connectivity. A big focus on exports, and there's a lot of sectors there. Um, renewables is the obvious one, where Scotland could be, could be a world leader for decades or centuries to come, if we've got our minds to it and we've got a government that's focused on that. All of that is very, very important, and there's huge opportunities there. Um, I'm going to let you have a look at this, because I show this all the time, because it really puts into context a number of things. It puts into context the, uh, the scare stories that we hear and the sand that they're built on because they really are nonsense. And it also puts into context the destruction that's been wreaked on uh, Scotland's industrial base by successive Westminster governments. This is a quote from 1979, which some of you may, may remember. I can just about remember it. Um, and it's all about, uh, it's from the Daily Express, warning people not to hold no for the Scottish Assembly referendum in that year. Um, and if you look at that, if you know your, your history, obviously that's the industrial heartland of Scotland in the 60s and 70s, which we didn't get the assembly, and then they proceeded to destroy the industrial base. This is a chart of uh, a number of European countries and what's happened to their manufacturing base over the last 30 years. And guess which one's the UK? Um, other countries, Germany, Austria, Finland, Sweden, countries that I've uh, worked and spent time in, have done much, much better. And maintaining their manufacturing base. There's competition from China and India, of course there is, but if you do the right things, you can keep our manufacturing base much healthier than uh, the one we've got in the UK. Scotland's got an opportunity to uh, to get back to the levels of, of, of investment in manufacture that some of our, our neighbours in Scandinavia and in Europe have managed to, managed to support. And the last thing on, uh, on opportunities about connectivity, this is data on passenger numbers going through a number of uh, European airports. If you look at um, Denmark, you look at Norway, countries very similar to, uh, to Scotland, and you look at Copenhagen and Oslo Airport, each of whom put through 21, 22, 23 million passengers. Um, and you compare that to Edinburgh Airport, 9 million, Glasgow Airport, 7 million. Um, it, it shows you the, the difference in the amount of traffic we've got going through their airports. Why is that important? It's important for tourism and it's important for business connectivity. Um, at the moment, as you know, if you're trying to do business, you've really got to travel through. To a, a, an airport, London or Manchester or whatever, very often, and uh, the tourism industry is hampered because of that. Policies like that passenger duty give us the opportunity to open up um, connectivity internationally from Scotland, um, which is going to be, as I say, great value for the economy in a number of sectors. And I'm going to finish up with a wee story from, uh, from our near neighbour, Norway, which hopefully puts into perspective um, the size of the prize, the opportunity that we are sitting on. Um, potentially in an independent Scotland, um, because um, we, uh, we we look at Norway and kind of think it could be ever be like that. And I just want to try and put some of that that in context. 
And it's a wee story about the Prime Minister of Norway that goes for a walk along the fjord one day, as you do, and he, um, he stumbles across the magic lamp and he picks it up and gives it a rub in the genie. Pops out and the genie says to him, I'll give you some wishes to make Norway a better country. And the Prime Minister of Norway says, well, that's, uh, that's difficult. We're just about the richest country in the world. But the measure of these things and tell us that we're one of the happiest countries in the world. We've we'll got pretty much no poverty to speak of. People have got good, well-paid jobs and leisure time to enjoy it. Um, he says, I can't really think of much that would make us, make us a better place. He says, well, you, you need to think of something. So the Prime Minister says, OK, I can think, uh, think of a few things. He said, we've got a great economy, but it's quite narrow. It's built on oil, fisheries, not much else. It'd be great if we had another sector we could rely on into the future. I said, we've got this national drink called Aquavit that nobody's ever heard of. We like drinking it, but nobody knows what it is. It'd be great if that was a world-renowned brand and people from Singapore to Chicago would pay stupid money to take it off our hands. And we were the only people that could make this stuff and we couldn't make enough of it. That'd be a nice wee, wee earner for us. says, yeah, well, we can, uh, we can do that for you. He said, we've got a problem with our language. Um, we speak Norwegian. Nobody else in the world speaks Norwegian. If they want to go on holiday, they're going to do business. They've got to learn another language. It'd be great if you could make Norwegian the, the world business language so that if we got off a plane in Tokyo or Brazil, we just spoke Norwegian and everybody understood what we were talking about. That'd make business a wee bit easier. As well as doing it. We can do that for you. He said, um, We've got a problem, our country's beautiful, Norway, but it's, it's big um, and the weather's horrible, minus 35 in the winter, snow up to here, snow plows out three months of the year, doing business, just travelling about, it's hard work. Um, he said it'd be, it'd be great if with the same natural resources and the same population in a country that was a quarter the size and a nice mild winter so we didn't have to worry about the snow plows for three months of the year. He says, yeah, we can, uh, we can do that for you. He said, we've got a problem getting to our main markets in Europe. We've got to go through two other countries, which makes export difficult. It'd be great if we had another big market. I mean, if you maybe take 60 million people in a new landmass, just bolt them onto our southern border. Um, we wouldn't want to be ruled by them, you understand. We just want to do business for them. A nice big world city there we can trade with. They all speak their region, of course, and they're all dying to buy our, our drink and our oil and our energy and our whatever. That would make life a wee bit easier. It'd be great if we had four of the top 100 universities in the world in Norway. Um, it'd be great if you had a diaspora, tens of millions of Norwegians that could trace up their ancestry back to, to Norway around and all the world's uh, main economies that wanted us to do as well and wanted to, to help us. And it'd be great if we had uh, an industrial heritage going back 200 years so that when people did business with our technology companies, they respected what we've done and what we'd invented, our scientists and our engineers have invented over the, over the centuries. And it'd be, um, it'd be great if we had a stronger national brand in Norway, that would help our tourism and help the recognition of people you who are National Poet was, for example, and we celebrated every year in, in Moscow, Washington, and our, our national dress was uh, instantly recognisable around the world. And no point is, no campaign laugh at us for talking about one day we could be as, uh, as successful as Norway. Norway in 1970 was poorer than Scotland, but they built a couple of cars, they've got a country of five million people, coherent democracy, um, they can, uh, people can go on and get things done, it's very responsive to what the people want, they're focused in the right sectors. They've got a shipbuilding sector that puts us to shame. They've got 39 shipyards, about 100 ships last year. The average wage in Norway is £52,000 a year. How they're globally competitive at shipbuilding, I have no idea. Right? But they're smart, they're clever, and they go on and they get it done. Um, and it just shows you what we can do if we put our, put our mind to it. Um, so yeah, so uh, it's all about what the opportunity is. The opportunity is there. The only bit of the jigsaw that's missing is to get people out to vote, uh, vote yes in September. Quite a lot to be done, quite a lot of work to be done after that, but we can build something really special here if we, uh, if we put our minds to it. Look forward to your questions. Thanks very much.